Welcome into another episode of Cyberly. I am your host, Blythe Brumley. But on this show, we talk about B2B marketing, the attention economy, and how it all fits into the world of logistics. And in today's episode, we are focusing on founders by having a conversation with Nate Schutz. Here is a little bit of his resume. He's the VP of Global Fulfillment and Logistics at Blue Dot. But what he's on the show today for is to talk about his podcasting journey. About a year ago, or really less than a year ago, about Eight or nine months ago, he started up a podcast called The Host of the Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics. That's his show right here on Freight Waves. You can find it in like the Freight Cast area and also just by subscribing directly to The Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics. And he's telling the much needed story behind the motivations and the fears of founders and freight and just the overall logistics space. So we've got a lot to talk to him about today. So let's go ahead and welcome in Nate to the show. Nate, welcome into Cyberly. Thank you, Blythe. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an honor because I, I spent, gosh, the better part of yesterday uh, fixing some things that were outside that was on my porch. So I had your, your podcast in my ear and I binged at least seven episodes of the podcast and I'm working my way through them. Just really fantastic stuff. So it was great timing to get you on the show. And, and you've been doing this for, like I said, about nine or 10 months now. So what's been your experience so far? What's the emotion that, that you first think of as you have looked back on this podcasting journey? Oh man, the, the first one that comes to my mind is fear. I was mm-hmm. absolutely terrified to do this. I know that sounds silly. How could you be afraid to do a podcast? But that's not live. It's not video. This this actually makes me nervous. I don't like being on video typically. <laughs> and so the the idea of putting something out into the world that was purely of my own creation was absolutely terrifying. And then I realized I started to connect with so many of these founders because they had the same fear. They had to, they had an idea and were compelled to bring it into reality and figured out how to do it one step at a time. And so each time that I would help share a founder's story, I began to get a little bit more confident in my own storytelling and my ability to unlock what makes each founder special. But when I look back on it, it seems funny now that I was that afraid, but the first day that we published an episode, the night before I didn't sleep, a wink. And that entire day I was terrified, not that people were going to not like it, but that nobody would care. I, I thought, what if I put all this time and effort in and it's a dud and nobody listens? And then what does that say about me? So looking back, it's funny to think about, but in the moment it was very real. Now you've done several episodes since that initial launch and you you've had these amazing conversations with other founders and I won't ask you know what if you have a favorite episode because honestly I could say that like all of them are my favorite so far that I've listened to sure. but when you are talking to a lot of these founders what are some common themes among them because it feels like there are some common themes and some common threads that you're unraveling for them during these conversations There are. I thought in the beginning going into it that I was going to discover a commonality that they all had some superpower, whether it was an intellectual ability or a tolerance for risk. And what I realized that actually distinguishes them from anybody else who's ever wanted to start a company but hasn't is they simply started. They didn't have the answers. They did not know what was going to happen a month or six months later. They simply took an action saw what happened, almost like an experiment, and then took another step. And they kept iterating back and forth, learning as they went. And in a lot of cases, the companies that they have now look very, very differently than what their original idea was, or the team might be completely different. And so I think that's the the thing that has stood out to me the most is they took action where a lot of other folks simply talk or come up with business plans and generate ideas and buy domain names. I mean, who hasn't bought six or eight or, you know, 20.com names thinking that they'll start a business one day and those domains are just vacant. There's nothing happening there. And it's, it's kind of a, a funny habit that entrepreneurial minded people have is to go and buy domain names, but every single domain name represents an idea that they had. And if it's not being put into the world and not being tried, there's something sort of sad about that because you know they're not mm. getting to experience what some of these other founders have. It doesn't mean that every founder is going to be successful. In fact, most 
don't reach the goals that they set out to business is very, very difficult. But the ones that took that action to a T, I, I have yet to speak with a founder who says, I regret trying. Oh, I love that. And I am guilty of that as well, as far as like having, you know, a, a, an account with probably 40 different domain names in it. And only about 10 of those websites are actually live. The rest of them are just ideas that I had that I just wanted to make sure that I could use it as like an insurance policy that, you know, when I do have time, I'm going to get back to that idea and, and, and see it through. But um, the cycle just repeats itself every now and then. So when you are talking to these businesses, you 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 call it what is it the the new school of logistics entrepreneurs and how they collaborate with each other. Can you give us some examples of that in action? Sure. There are so many times. Maybe in three PL fulfillment is a is a great example where it ends up being very regional or very local, and yet they're engaging with potential clients that have needs all over the country. And so rather than saying, hey, I can't do that, or I can, but let me figure it out, there's so much lead sharing that happens back and forth between 3PL founders and owners saying, oh, I know somebody who does that in that area. I mean, literally 10 minutes before we started this, I made an introduction between two people who wanted to to work on something in the cold chain uh, in a specific region of the country. And I was glad to be able to make that introduction. And they'll now hopefully have a conversation that leads to some degree of commercial success. So that's one example where simply the introductions and connecting people one at a time, you you don't know where it can go. You don't know what's on the other side of that door. And then on the flip side, you have businesses that, and owners who are straight up competitors, maybe it's a freight brokerage or a SaaS product, and they actually are legitimately going head to head on the same opportunities And yet they will often say the same thing. The size of the pie that's out there in the industry is so large that why don't we as bootstrap founders go after some of the legacy large providers collectively and not leave each other alone, but let's help make each other stronger. Hey, I didn't win that opportunity. Here's what I learned. Maybe you can leverage that to to win your next opportunity. Things that are sort of unheard of if you've grown up in a, in a different school of thought that's hyper-aggressive, extremely competitive. And I don't know how long that movement is going to last. I mean, there's parts of it that feel very utopian. And it's probably not going to survive you know, the, the, the recession completely. But one founder said to me, I actually think it'll get stronger during the recession because we're going to need each other more. So however long it lasts, to me, it's a perhaps brief moment in the sun and these founders are enjoying working together, the friction that they experience in their lives is lower as founders and business owners because they're not going it alone. They're talking to other founders and they're connecting and collaborating. And it's a more, not peaceful existence, but a more pleasant existence. I think every founder that I've talked to has said roughly the same thing. I wish I could talk to more founders like me, or I wish I could could connect with others because this is really hard to do. Business is really hard. Entrepreneurship is difficult. And I don't want to do it alone. Wow. So would you say that was the the big catalyst for you focusing on founders when starting up your podcast is that you really wanted to tell this story because you know founders are in such a unique position? I've always been fascinated by founders. I started doing my own kind of consulting as a side hustle, you know, seven or eight years ago. I had an opportunity to come to me and it was just put in my lap and it was to work with a small founding team that was developing a logistics SaaS product and went through that project and learned how they approached bringing a product to market that did not exist and the software development that went into that. And I got to peek behind the scenes of day zero in a company. How did they go about it? And then over the years would have other founders reach out to me. I didn't make the connection until years later that I love working with and for founders. There is something about the ownership that they take, not equity ownership, but the ownership that they take over the big idea behind their company, the intentionality that they have around the culture that they want to build and how they show up in the world. That to me, I don't want to use the word intoxicating, but it is almost intoxicating because they're so, most of them are so crystal clear in what it is that they're going after And that certainty is very attractive. It's fun to be around people that are doing what they were made to do. So I say there's nothing more attractive than a person who's found their purpose. 
And so many of these founders have exactly found that. And just to even get to be in the passenger seat and help share their story with the broader audience is a huge privilege. And, and I think too, on the, the opposite side of the founder story is that, that fear, that uncertainty, because I, I, yeah, I talked about earlier that I had listened to your show, you know, over and over again yesterday. And it was one of those things that it just caught me at the perfect time because I, you know, personally, I'm going through what does my next phase of my career look like? And a lot of it is, you know, it affects your mental health, you you stress about it, it's, you know, it affects your sleep. And not enough people talk about the mental health aspect of just in supply chain in general, but also within the space of being a founder. You're also very passionate about the mental health aspect. Is Are, are, are more founders, I guess, more open to sharing those thoughts and feelings with other founders more, or are they sort of keeping it really close to, really close to the chest? I would say it's different by founder, but again, back to this, this new school group, um, there's no common denominator about age or gender or, you know, any demographics that says, Hey, you're more likely to be open about that versus any other demographic. And so there are several that are still very tight lipped and, and they're very private. Others are saying, this is one of the most stressful and challenging things you can do in life is to start a business mm -hmm. and, and make it successful with the pressures of economics and uh, most have families and outside obligations. And eventually they reach a point if they don't, or if they go it alone, they often eventually reach a point of either a burnout or isolation. And that isolation is a very dangerous place to be if you're struggling with mental health. Uh, to me, it's a very personal topic. I lost a brother to suicide when I was in my 20s. And so it's something that I, I personally care about very deeply. And so to be able to create a small and temporary place for founders to connect with one another and open up because they, they can't all open up in public. They can't even all open up to their employees because they have to maintain a, a positive and confident, not persona, but to some degree, you know, image, and yet they're all people. And I, I've had a great opportunity to bring several founders together in kind of private conversations where they can support one another and they, they understand the challenge that the other person is going through. And they may have just come out of the same storm that somebody else is going into. And, and they can offer, you know, technical advice too on whether it's banking or insurance or cybersecurity and not going it alone the feedback that I've heard is, you know, my spouse or partner is glad that I have other outlets to be able to share my challenges with rather than bringing it home all the time. And, you know, one founder said to me, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I've always wanted to belong to something as a founder. And I feel like I'm finding it in that I can connect with other founders and be super vulnerable and say, some days I wonder why I'm doing this. This is way more, I should just get a job or I should sell the company. Or others who are on the, the upswing and think, man, life can't ever get better than this. This has never been, I've never had so much fun. And mm -hmm. after spending enough time around, you know, at this point, nearly 40 episodes, every single founder goes through all of those emotions, sometimes in the same day. And that is a mentally and emotionally and psychologically fraught environment. And so why would you knowingly go into a situation without support? And especially when there's so much support available out there, whether it's hotlines or um, support groups or other founders, th there is a ton of help out there and people are genuinely interested in, in helping one another. So it's become sort of a unintended side effect of the Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics is there is a community that is starting to develop and already has developed organically where these fascinating people are hanging out with one another and, and opening up to one another. And again, it's a privilege. I did not anticipate any of that happening. And I'm curious to see where it goes next because I, to me, it's play. I get to a front row seat to, to learn from some of the brightest minds in our industry who are doing amazing things and shaping the future of what supply chain is going to look like. And they're just people. They're not, they, they may have some extraordinary abilities and have taken some amazing risks, but they're still people. They're no different than anybody else. 
And it's easy to forget that and idolize successful entrepreneurs and can forget, you know, especially in the age of social media, there's a person behind that post or, you know, there's a lot of trolls out there and people will criticize anything that gets created and put out into the world. Uh, maybe we have a small window of opportunity to push back on that a little bit and, and bring a little bit of light to the situation. And any person who works in a company and has a job owes their job to somebody who started that company, whether it was five years ago or 50 years ago, somebody planted a flag in the ground and started that company that you work for. And we, we all owe them some debt of gratitude. And maybe we can do it by just recognizing their basic humanness. And it's such a, a really well way to, to say that because it is all of those things that you, all those emotions that you were talking about. I'm like, yep, yep. Yep. I'm nodding my head as if, yes, uh, all of them experienced in one day, several times. And it's, it's a lot to deal with. And you're able to talk to people and really pull out those emotional moments for them, both publicly on your podcast. And then uh, of course, privately as well. How have you mastered the art of the interview so quickly because you, you you weren't a podcast host before, but it feels listening to your show. It feels like you've been a podcast host for years. First, thank you. That means a lot to me because I actually recall reaching out to you in the early days and saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm making this up as I go. How do I get better at this? And you were kind enough to to share some of your advice and and guidance when I was, I wouldn't say drowning, but when I was questioning, is this is this working at all? I would say when things started to change for me was when I stopped over preparing. I really genuinely studied storytelling for six months because I thought there was going to be some narrative that I could tap into and every story was going to somehow fit this mold and I could repurpose it over and over and over. And there are some great storylines out there, rags to riches, good versus evil, uh, the Cinderella story, those kinds of um, narratives exist and they get retold in Hollywood all the time. I thought that was the right way to approach the show. And then I realized a few months in, all I had to do was ask a couple of questions and establish rapport and trust with the guests in a way that they felt comfortable revealing things in public that are very private and honoring their response and, and giving them a chance to, to reflect on their own journey and I can share like very candidly before we record episodes and after we record episodes, the conversation goes all over the place. Um, I have cried with founders. They have cried to me mm -hmm. in private and shared, you know, their challenges or their successes or what they, what their hopes are for the next phase. And somewhere in there, the, the relationship shifted and I began to not see founders as potential guests myself, but as people who are navigating a complicated industry and a challenging time in history. And if the best thing I can do to offer them support is ask a couple of insightful questions and give them a chance to be themselves, unscripted, um, it felt like a really simple way to honor them. Um, I don't mean to make it incredibly deep and heartfelt, but for me, it is. It is. Uh, it's a passion, and I'm an emotional guy. And so it, it taps into something that it's like playing tennis. The ball goes back and forth, and not every interview is like that. Not every conversation mm -hmm. is is deep and meaningful. Sometimes it's it's difficult, um, and other times it's like playing jazz, and we're just riffing back and forth, and we're on the same wavelength, and magic kind of happens. And so, how did we get there? I think we got there by me getting out of the way and simply learning to draw out what somebody else already had instead of uh, putting the mold on them that I thought the show should be like. And then it just stopped being a show. And then it was just a conversation. Hmm. And who isn't willing and able to just sit down one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation? Who doesn't like to, to share their experiences? Who doesn't want to be listened to? I want to be heard. I want to be listened to. and somewhere in there, we found something special. 
So when you, so you, you start a podcast, you've never been a podcaster before and it's going really, really well. And you decide I'm going to start studying storytelling. I think in, in your, your six month recap episode, which I particularly enjoyed, you talked about, you know, developing a system, especially with, with posting to social media, you studied copywriting. What did you learn during that process and what do you still have left to learn when it comes to producing a show? Is there is there any part of that process that you want to get better at or is it all the things? One, what you see and same for your show, what you see is only 10% of the work that goes in. The planning and the scheduling, scripting, editing, promoting, that's for the, that's the lion's share of the work that that goes unseen. I did not appreciate that in the beginning. I learned to appreciate it. And then I learned how to automate and delegate. So I have a system built now where I have somebody else do my editing for me. I transcribe episodes uh, into writing so I can quickly breeze through it and try to find the nuggets that are the most relevant and then share those, promote them on Tuesdays, let everyone know that the episodes are out there. And then stay connected with guests and founders after the show. Otherwise, it's just a transactional relationship. And that's not what I'm after. And I hope it's not what, what most others are after as well. So l- learning the, the basics of podcasting, it's not that hard. It's intimidating at first, but there's some technical and digital pieces that you have to learn. But there's tools for all of that. And it's almost free. There's very, very little cost associated with it. So if anybody has a topic that they know if someone handed you a microphone and you could talk for 30 minutes with no preparation about, that's what you should have a podcast on. It might be ballet. It might be baseball. It might be parenting. Whatever it is, there's a topic that you care a lot about. Maybe you could have a podcast on that tomorrow. And there's in the logistics space, there is still room for dozens and dozens more content creators and podcasters and bloggers. The, the industry is too big for any one person to cover or even the, the wide and impressive group of people that are out there like yourself creating content right now. We're still only scratching the surface. So my encouragement to anybody who's watching is if you're really passionate about something yourself and you'd like to have a show, there's literally nothing stopping you from doing it. You could get it going in a week. And if you can get past one episode, you can get to two. And if you can go beyond seven episodes, that's the the critical number. If you get a podcast going beyond seven episodes, it's going to have a a high success rate. More than half die at the seven episode mark because people lose interest or they say what they originally set out to say or they underestimated the, the back office and back end work of, of creating content. I've been fortunate to find a system and a structure that works for me and a schedule that I can f- slot it into my life in a way that's not super intrusive and feeds me instead of uh, takes from me. And again, then it just becomes a sandbox and it's play because I love logistics. I absolutely love it. And I love working with founders. And so if you can find something, if you already have something like that, take a risk. And I promise a year after you start that, your life will look different. It, you will have new opportunities and doors open that you wouldn't possibly imagine could ever happen just because you took a risk. Amazingly well put. I wish we had more time to dive into more questions because I have about a million more, but where can folks, you know, follow more of your work, you know, subscribe to the podcast, all that good stuff. The Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics, you can Google that and, you know, whether you listen on Apple or Spotify, of course, you can go to the Freight Waves page and check out the Freightcast section there. I'm on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, Twitter is Logistics Twit and please go ahead, like, and subscribe to the show. And if you are a founder or you know a founder who bootstrapped their company, please send them my way. I'd love to help share their story. Thank you so much, Nate. Wonderful conversation. I highly advise everybody to go subscribe to the podcast. We got it linked in the show notes as well as your social media handles. So thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks, Blythe. Absolutely.
what an awesome conversation. This is a, one of those moments where you wish you had, you know, sort of the, the you know, the full experience of where you could talk to somebody for, for literally hours. Cause Nate, I'm telling you, his podcast is incredible and really, really touched me and, you know, sort of right at the, the right moment for me and, and my career. But, you know, as far as, you know, the, the overall, I guess, founder story and things like that, we're going to be learning a lot of those founder stories. We're going to be learning a lot about the new trends going on in logistics and overall supply chain space. That's because we've got F3 coming up in just a couple short weeks. I already got my tickets. I'm booked. I'm ready to go. So in case you haven't gotten registered yet, you don't want to miss this. It's in the beautiful city of Chattanooga. I'm excited to finally get up there and check out that city and their super fast internet, which has been, you know, sort of a, I guess, a topic of discussion around the internet for so long now. But if you want to find more of my work, you can go and check out everythingislogistics.com. That's where all of my socials and all the cyberly episodes. I link them there. But until next time, we have one more show to go next week with none other than Tim Dooner. He's going to be joining Cyberly right before F3. So hope you guys all tune in. But until then, we will see you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.